I often will do it laying down, but I was awake and I would feel also my body rocking. Mm -hmm. And I knew after doing it once or twice what was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, I was skyrocketing through the cosmos and the stars were flying by. And I literally felt G forces on my face. And it was, it was an incredible roller coaster ride. But the minute, you know, I started thinking, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I don't want this to end. It would end. And, and they usually only lasted a minute and a half, maybe. Um. Welcome, Heather Tash. Well, hello, <laughs> Lee. It is so great to be here. When we met, I was on your show, yes. uh, Beyond with Heather Tash, which talks about near-death experiences. So I was on talking about a temple of all-knowing and my near-death experience, mm -hmm. but we became fast and furious friends. I think yes. we were just, we stayed on forever and texted <laughs> after, <laughs> learned a lot about each other. And so I just want to thank you for coming mm -hmm. on my new show. You were very instrumental in uh, me having the courage really to just get that extra push oh. to do it. So thank you. Oh, you are so welcome. And I'm so glad that you did it. You have so much to share and you have such a great presence. And I know that you're going to be great too at getting guests and picking out guests and, and just your interview style. And I was where you were at. So I know exactly how it is when you're starting out. That's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about. Next chapters. Yeah. And, um, and spirituality and, um, and fears and overcoming yeah. things like that. So when you moved from this massive career journalist, meteorologist. You did mm -hmm. that for over 30 years, I think. I then did. Then this influencer in this realm of near-death experiences, and you're doing this, you, you're very successful. Your channel's doing amazing. So how did that transition happen? It, it certainly is a leap of faith because I was working as a meteorologist, as a journalist for uh, about three decades. And it was a wonderful career. And I loved it. And I love the people that I met along the way. I love the places that I worked. Um, the most notable one is the Weather Channel. That's where I was the longest and where most people know me from. But I've worked in Minneapolis and I've worked in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania and Portland, Maine and other spots along the way. So it was a wonderful career. And it is very hard to leave something like that because that's stability. But I also had this passion for learning more about spiritual things. And I've always had that passion. My very first college paper was on near-death experiences. So, you know, I've loved this and it's my passion. And, and I really wanted to lean more into that. I mean, the science was great and it was fun and I learned so much but I really felt at this point in my life, you know, I wanted to do something that I was just absolutely passionate about in a new direction. And then also, I've never worked for myself before. I've always worked for somebody else. And I really wanted to take the opportunity to do that. And fortunately, my husband was very supportive because I think that really helped that when I said, hey, I'm thinking of doing this, he's like, go for it. And if he hadn't, it would have been harder to step into it. Um, but it's nice when you have somebody saying that because I'm I'm kind of like, hey, I'm gonna give up this career, this income, for you know just trying to do something. It may work, it may not. So um, so it's it's an exciting time too, though. I I often liken it to when I was first in uh, some of my first jobs, you know, where I was hoping I could get a job as a First, it was a television news reporter, and then I went back to school for meteorology. But it's like you hope, and then it's those exciting times when you don't really know what's ahead, but you're very hopeful. And it kind of was starting like that again, where I'm like, I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm excited and I'm hopeful. And I know I'm going to have a lot of fun and meet a lot of great people like you, Lee, and um, just learn so much. So it's been a wonderful journey. I'm so glad I took the leap of faith. Um, but for anybody thinking about it, I, I know it's hard. It, it really took me years of thinking about it. Um, probably, you know, even longer, you know, maybe close to over a decade when I really started thinking about wanting to do something on my own, but I hadn't really formed yet what I wanted to do. And that's a really great point about 
not just leaping, not just yes. jumping on mm-hmm. something, but really being in the space of allowing for the stew, right, to, yes. to, to simmer, and that for you to have that clarity to move forward uh, when you did. It's great to have a supportive spouse. Okay. And um, mm-hmm. and so I found it fascinating that you had been fascinated by near-death experiences for quite a while, yes. even before it was mainstream or yes. as mainstream as it is now. It was And um, And so tell me about that. What do you think was the initial spark for you? Like, even if you want to take me back to the early childhood or your first memories of any kind of spiritual experience that started that spark uh, to ignite? I do think that I've always had that inclination. It's kind of like, you know, when I was a little kid, I was drawn to animals. I'm still drawn to animals. You know, I especially love cats. I I have cats and I have a dog. So I mean, I'm just always had that attraction. Where did it come from? I think I was just born with it. Whereas somebody else might be born where they just love music and they learn to play the piano right away. So it's kind of like that for me. I, I, even at, as a young age, I remember um, before in bed, you know, it wasn't just a prayer, but kind of conversations, trying to wanting and really yearning to know more and asking to, to know more. And this is when I was probably six or seven years old. Mm. And I do remember then when I was in probably in high school, I was reading things about the mind and hypnosis. And I thought it was fascinating, you know, what our mind can do and that um, your thoughts can really lead to, I call it your thoughts can create your reality. And there's a couple of ways to look at that. One is you literally change the energy around you and it creates your reality. But it also is when you get in your mind, I can do this, you're going to take the actions and the steps to do it. So probably that was it initially. And then when I first heard about near-death experiences, I was fascinated. I, I do remember that I had a friend of the family and, and his mother had died and he was saying how she reached out on her deathbed. And then about the same time, one of the first things I read was a Reader's Digest article on near-death experiences and it just was fascinating. And, and But back then there was so little that was out there that you could find it. Anytime a book came out, you know, Betty Eady's book came out, it was like, oh, you know, I read it. And then it was a while till the next one. I remember reading Daniel Brinkley's book. Mm-hmm. But you had to wait. It's not like now where you can jump on the internet and there's just, you know, you can hear so many fascinating stories. So is it nature? Is it nurture? I, I kind of think um, a lot of it is nature that I was born with this kind of drive and interest. And then just things probably kind of sparked it along the way to um, just have everything sort of fall into place. But of course, you know, I wrote that first college paper. Back then, there was no such thing as podcasting. You certainly couldn't make a career out of studying, at least at my level, studying near-death experiences. So it really has evolved greatly since then. And back then, it was, you know, a little too out there for a lot of people. So did you have a foundation in religion or yes. spirituality? Yes. Like, what were your parents like? So um, I grew up in the Lutheran church, and I do think it was good to have that base because I was very curious and I and I wanted to learn more. And I think for a lot of us, we don't necessarily have to give up our base if we're comfortable with it. If we're not, we can let it go. But sometimes we just expand it. And we start to look at things a little bit differently. And I think that's how I've seen it along the way. The more I learn, the more I kind of expand what I believe. Um, But it was really good, I think, to have that foundation. And um, and Were your parents supportive of your research, your curiosity? That's a good question. I think... That I don't know if they knew how much I was interested in it. And by the time I started reading books about it, I was probably in college. So I 
I remember they bought me a book on dream interpretations for Aww. Christmas one year, and that's because I wanted it. So, and um, they probably saw me reading the little book about hypnosis. But I don't know, it, it may have been after that. My, my father also died when I was 18. So that also probably contributed to wanting to learn more about that. So, so that could have been one of the factors. So it was probably after that, that I read my first book on it. And now that you've done your, um, your podcast mm -hmm. and what is your belief about the afterlife, mm. especially coming from a journalistic background that I'd like your perspective on that. What I've come to believe is that first of all, beliefs shouldn't necessarily be fixed. I find that I'm much more fluid in what I believe. So what I believed two years ago, it might be different now. And what I believe two years from now might be different. And I think that is because there is so much to know. What lies next, what is beyond, is so beyond our comprehension. So it is, I, I like having my base but I know it's so much bigger than that. And I am open to learning all that is there, um, what I can. But really, when you think about how much we know compared to all, all that there is, you know, it's the most fractional point of, you know, point zero 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 zero, whatever. I mean, it, it is infinite what lies beyond. And when I learned something, Sometimes when I first learned it, I'm like, mm, that's a little too out there for me. But then you hear it again when you hear it again, and you start to go, huh, well, maybe that is part of it. And so that's why I, I have learned to be very fluid in what I believe. I think God is very loving. I don't know that God cares what we call God. A lot of people will say source. I mean, God is the source of all things. Um, so I think that I'm very comfortable with other people believing differently than me, having different terminology than me. But I, I believe that it's all about love and that we are here to learn and grow. And the questions, you know, that we will be asked when we go back is, what did you learn? And how, how did you love? And those are probably hopefully intertwined because hopefully we're, we're learning about love. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to do my podcast is I felt like that was something we needed more of in our society, that we have, sometimes I want to say that we've gotten away from it, but I'm not sure if we were ever there because there always have been groups that have certainly been marginalized and been harmed in our society. But there's certainly a lot of divisiveness that is out there. And I think that I want people just to be kinder, more empathetic, more understanding of one another so that we don't have to agree with a person, but we can still love them and accept them and go, oh, you know, I could see where they're like that because of their background. And I can see why I believe what I believe because of my background. And that's the case, not just with religion, but in politics and everything that is out there that we're divisive, divisive on. If we can just say it's okay that we're not all alike and um, just really focus on ourselves and how can I be kinder? How can I be more accepting? That sort of thing. I agree 1000%. <laughs> all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the idea of the oneness of mm -hmm. all that we mm -hmm. are, yes, I think helps with that process because if we can wrap our head around that we are from the one source, creator, God, source, the divine mm -hmm. universe, spirit, whatever name you want to give. Right. And that we are individually having these experiences and that individually our soul has had a lot of experience. You could experiences, mm -hmm. you could say hundreds or thousands or more. Um, and that our goal is to have these 
separate experiences to bring back that knowledge and wisdom to yeah. source energy, that then we start to look at other people where they are mm -hmm. and say, oh, they're just having that experience. One of my phrases I like to use is take what resonates and leave the rest. It just might be a seed for later. And as yes. we are evolving and expanding constantly, mm -hmm. you're using the word fluid in belief. Yes. Um, I use you know, being able to stretch. So right. knowing that we are where we are in our belief today, and hopefully it will change. You're right. We Hopefully. want to be able to expand that. We don't want to get stuck. And I do think that as a child, some of my faith was based on fear. Mm. And that is one thing that I've evolved away from is, is now I see that God is love. And, and I'm not going to believe the wrong thing. You know, God's going to love me through whatever I believe. And that's still a hard thing for a lot of people to understand. And I get that because it is very hard to sometimes break away from what we're comfortable with, what we've been taught. But I've also realized as I've done this podcast and, and I consider, you know, what I believe, everything we've ever believed has been taught to us by another person mm -hmm. and people are flawed. You know, it, you know, we were taught by our parents or pastors and they were taught by somebody. And, and even if it's coming from from a book, it's it's something that went through the the minds and the hands of a human being, and so I think we have to realize that sometimes, although very well intentioned, there are flawed people that have guided us in the wrong direction. And when you give your power to someone else, mm -hmm. and you know that I'm just going to believe what this person is believing or telling me to believe. Right. That's why we must do the inner work so that we are in alignment with mm -hmm. our source and our belief. Right. I love what you said about prayer. It's one of the questions I like to to ask is, do you pray? And you said from an early age, you had more conversation, more conversation, which is my favorite type of prayer. Yes. Um, and so how has your prayer life evolved? through these years? It's, I would say it's very much the same in that it's more of an ongoing dialogue in that, you know, throughout the day, I'm often saying something or, or asking for something. Um, so it's less about sitting down and saying a prayer as it is about just kind of always having that channel open. One thing I do want to get better at is listening more. I'm very good at telling God what to do. <laughs> very good at that. But, but it's harder to take the time to quiet your mind and to listen. And that's something that I have. I've done it in the past and it was wonderful, but that was a long time ago where I was very good at meditating. And I want to bring more of that into my life so that I can be more open to listening as well as commanding. <laughs> Isn't it funny how it's, it's, whether it's meditation or it's supplements or exercise, mm -hmm. how we are in the zone and it's feeling amazing and yeah. we're up the vibrational scale and then we're like, eh, and then life takes us in a different yes. direction and we fall off the health wagon or the, yes. <laughs> or yes. the meditation wagon. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it absolutely, to me, Mm -hmm. is the best way to get rid of all the static so that you can have that clearer channel. Yes, it is. It's a, it is a great way. And I know that. And even knowing that, because I've had some really amazing experiences, but this was 20 years ago. And I've, you're right. And it was funny as like, I don't remember the day I stopped running, but there were, I used to run. And then suddenly I didn't. And it was probably a trickle down. Same with meditation. Used to meditate. No, I don't. I used to hike a lot more. And then I started this podcast and I got really busy. And now I don't even do that. And I love to do that. But, and my dog wants me to do that. So I do think that we need to be better sometimes about making time, excuse me, making time for things that are really beneficial to us. We think that we don't need that fuel and, and we need it more than we realize. Especially now. 
Yeah. Especially uh, self-love now. and self-care is the first yeah. step. Yes. Then we give from the overflow. Mm-hmm. Another saying, live yeah, and, mindfully, give from the overflow. And listening to, I've heard a lot of people that I've interviewed, you know, tell me how important that channel of knowing so that we can get our own guidance and intuition in a world that it's very easy to get lost in what other people say. And, you know, and it's like, who do you believe? I don't, you know, where do I go? What should I think sometimes? Um, so I think that it is good that we can try to keep our own guidance, you know, going to take this path, Absolutely. wherever this journey leads us. Yep. Totally agree. So you said that you had some experiences uh, when you were meditating. Mm-hmm. What would you say were, were the most profound, you could say unexplainable or supernatural or spiritual? What, what are, give us an example of some of those experiences. So for meditation, I would sometimes, and this probably happened maybe five times. So it's, you know, when you meditate, a lot of times you're just, you know, it's just a kind of typical experience. But one, I did feel like I got into this kind of zone, which is a little bit different than just closing your eyes and be quiet. I did feel like I entered a zone, but there were about five different times or so, maybe six, where I, um, I often will do it laying down, but I was awake and I would feel all of my body rocking. And I knew after doing it once or twice what was going to happen. And then all of a sudden, I was skyrocketing through the cosmos and the stars were flying by. And I literally felt G-forces on my face. And it was, it was an incredible roller coaster ride. But the minute, you know, I started thinking, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I don't want this to end. It would end. And, and they usually only lasted a minute and a half, maybe. Um, but they were incredible experiences, and I could not force them to happen. They always just happened on their own. So that's one of the really cool things um, that has happened to me with meditation. It, it's interesting because when I look back, I, I remember trying to meditate when I was in high school, and I didn't really know anything about it or what to do. But I do remember I would quiet my mind, and I would, I don't know if I was staring at a spot in the wall or whatever, but but. I would feel really large all of a sudden. I'd be like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm the size of an elephant. Mm. And I never really knew what that was until now as an adult, I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's kind of my soul expanding. And I didn't realize it. And so there are cool things that can happen. And and that's not necessarily why we meditate, but it's kind of fun to have them. It is. It's Mm -hmm. like that, um, if you're a golfer, it's like that sweet great shot that you have had and it's like finally you know goes down the fairway and yeah. and then you spend the rest of your life trying to get that same you know that same shot it's the right. same with meditation where there is a surrender in that space it's not something yeah. to conquer achieve or overcome but many of us who were or are <laughs> type a personalities we want to you know we're going to make that happen that yeah. that experience i want to have that again And it's like the universe laughs because it is not the attachment. And that's why when you do start to have one of these supernatural experiences um, and you go to grab it, like you just said, oh, I don't want this to end. Or you're like, "Ah," you know, when you grab it, Mm -hmm. that's when it goes. And, And I think the lesson is to be and practice that equanimous state. So that is just, there is no grasping, there is no Uh wanting. Which is really hard. It is. Well, it's a practice, right? Mm -hmm. It is a practice. I mean, wow. I've been practicing a long time. Still still haven't conquered that one. (laughs) Um, So have you had, well, well, I would call that an out-of-body experience, right? So you've had out-of-body experiences. Have you had any communication with the other side? I haven't done that through meditation. Now, I will say that when my dad died, he visited me in dreams all the time that first year. Mm-hmm. And he would always be in my dream and he'd say, I can't stay. I'm just here to kind of check in and say hello. So was that my subconscious mind? Possibly. 
that he, you know, it was my own making of it, or was he really visiting me? Possibly. So I'm, I'm open to certainly the idea that he may have been checking in with me. And it was interesting because that, because that first year I was grieving quite a bit. And I remember I couldn't even say his name without crying. But it, you know, after that first year was, it became easier. And that's when I didn't have him in my dreams anymore. And it was almost like, okay, you know, you don't need me now. You needed me that first year. Now he did, he has visited me a couple of times since, or I subconsciously created him. But I do remember that the last time he was in a dream, uh, right before he was leaving, he's like, see you soon. And I remember I woke up and I'm like, what do you mean? See you soon. <laughs> Fortunately, that was that was probably ten years ago, and uh, okay. I'm still here. So yeah, yeah. So, what do you think the purpose of life is? Mm. I, I do think now that we are here to learn, to grow, to learn how to love, and and I do think now that we, and this is things that I've evolved to believe that we do plan out a life here. I don't think we plan it every moment. I think there's a lot of free will. This is just my personal opinion, but I think we probably have key points in our life that we're going to hit, you know, planning to who's our family or those types of people that are in our lives. But, I, but ultimately, I think, as I mentioned earlier, when we finally pass from this life into the next, you know, that the questions will be, what did you learn? And how did you love? And, and that really is, I think, the key for all of us. And it's, it's so hard to bring that into everyday life. Sometimes, you know, I think it's really a practice that you have to do because there are going to be a lot of people in life you don't agree with. There are going to be a lot of people in life that aren't necessarily nice to you. Um, but when we can learn to allow them without letting it, really bother us, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty good achievement there. That doesn't mean you're, you don't have a compassion for them. You're just not going to let them influence how we feel. And it's hard to do. But with anything, practice makes us better at it. Yeah. And you think about it, like, I love that phrase where it's, um, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. And, and, I think the more that we focus on healing ourselves mm -hmm. and and going within and having that communication, mm -hmm. doing that self love and self care work, yeah. and mindfulness. I mean, it's one of the reasons why that's my foundation because it's awareness and non judgment. So the more that we can not judge ourselves, mm -hmm. the more that we are better equipped to manage the external world. That's and so yeah, and it's and often it's a reflection of what's going on inside of us. So if there is yes. a lot of contrast going on for you, once you start going inside and seeing where the contrast is within, mm -hmm. then it will it will dissolve on the external. And sometimes it's easier for us to see that in other people. We know that they react a certain way not because really of what happened here, it's what internally they how they interpreted it where somebody else might interpret that completely different. And it's because of their insecurities, their past experiences. So once you can start to see it in other people, hopefully we can turn that on ourselves and start to recognize, oh, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm reacting. And, and, I, and as, as you said, you know, meditation, going within, that's all good. I also think that just practicing things is good. You know, we can control our behavior. When you go into a shop and you've got a rude clerk, you can say, okay, I'm going to practice patience. And when in my comments, I have mean comments, just like on social media for many people, you can, boy, you can jump right in and, or you can not engage. Or you can just, you know, say, thanks for your thoughts um, and just leave it at, at something like that. But I think 
the problem with social media, what we've learned to do is we've become so combative because we don't see the other person. And I think that's starting to overflow into the real world. So now we're even rude to people like that, that are right in front of us sometimes. And, and, and we really have to practice. And social media is a great place where to practice, to hold your tongue, to not let it bother you. It's okay if somebody doesn't believe what you believe, even if you think they're crazy to think what they think. Um, it's okay. And they're on their journey too. And they're here to learn too. And maybe they'll always be that way. And maybe they'll evolve along the way too. But you engaging with them like this is not going to change their opinion. I've been pleasantly surprised that when I've had a real, a few really nasty posters on my, um, my channel, that when you allow them and you give them some, I don't want to say respect because I don't like their behavior necessarily, but when you sort of engage without combat, it's amazing how many come around and they actually start to realize they don't want to be mean because somebody's not pushing up against them. And I think that's something that we can all remember in all of life. And, and trust me, I'm not perfect. And especially when I first sometimes read something like that, or you first read something on social media, or you, you know, hear a politician you like, or one you don't like, and it's easy, of course, to get triggered. Yeah, yeah, triggered. But, but I think that we need to learn that we don't have to get triggered, we can still have strong beliefs in things, but let other people have theirs as well. And, um, and you're going to, as the saying goes, you know, it's a lot easier to bring them around, a bear around with honey, I think it is. You know, it, kindness goes a long way in, in getting people to listen to you. I think people want to be heard. They do. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and if you're empathic in any way, if you mm -hmm. feel things yes. more mm -hmm. heightened than mm -hmm. the average Joe, um, it is painful to receive uh, it's not just negative comments but mm -hmm. it's it's the the fire behind then you know the the comment yeah. um so to be able to take a beat and a breath and to not lean into that and to yeah. be able to say i i hear your your I understand what you're saying about the respect. But I hear your perspective. Yeah, your perspective. Um, that's a good way. And, or your opinion. Yeah, your opinion. Mm -hmm. And and I think um, not leaning into that and allowing somebody to be heard might might simply change someone's um, voice. And I like manner. how you said that. I hear your perspective because oftentimes I'll thank them for their perspective. And I think I like I hear you better <laughs> in some cases. It's probably more appropriate. Uh, so yeah. So we are living in a very interesting time. Yes. In in human history. Mm -hmm. And many people think we're going to hell in a handbasket. Mm -hmm. Or that it's the end of the planet or the yeah. end of human civilization. Mm -hmm. um, and many near death experiencers come back with prophetic messages. Yes. And you've heard them. I, I have, mm -hmm. I've listened to some near death experiencers, but I haven't certainly um, done the deep dive that you have. Yeah. And from all these different perspectives, I have my opinion, but okay. where do you think we are, the purpose of where we are, and where are we heading? Well, the first thing I would like to say is I have had guests on, and they have said, you know, this is what they believe is going to be happening. Never listen to one person. I would never go by what one person told me. It's more, I've started to formulate some thoughts on this because I've listened to many people. And so I am a little concerned just because of what some people have been saying. Now, granted, everybody that says we're going to be heading into some hard times, they also say because there's a much better outcome once we get beyond it. But that's not always a lot of comfort if we're heading into something. And so I do think... I like to hear about it personally, because then I can think, okay, well, what could I do to prepare? You know, that sort of thing. But I also have heard some near-death experiencers say 
you know, we shouldn't focus too much on it because we don't want to create it either. And our thoughts can create a reality, especially when it's a big collective. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have mixed feelings on it. I do want to learn about it, things that people have perspectives on, on just difficult times. But I also realize they may not be true. And they're not something that I should dwell on. And I shouldn't, I don't think we ever want to approach it with fear. I think we want to approach it with more learning something and trying to gain what we can from it, which, which is really hard for people to do. You know, it can be when you're hearing somebody say, you know, we've got challenging times coming up in the next year and it's going to get really messy. What are your thoughts on it? I'd love to hear your perspective. Well, like you, mm -hmm. um, I take in the information, mm -hmm. let it filter in and yeah. see what resonates in my body mm -hmm. and, and spirit. Um, I also think that I believe in the, the, the idea of, uh, of a multiverse and different timelines. Mm -hmm. um, I have felt physically felt timelines collapsing and, 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 shifting in that manner where it was like oh something just happened and what so happens think, if a if a timeline line collapses what happens well, to that I, timeline is it just gone poof it, it i you know i don't pretend to know um yeah, yeah. and i'm not a quantum physicist <laughs> um i know just a little bit enough to be you know dangerous to myself yeah, yeah. <laughs> well that's more than uh, i know so but i i had to wrap my head around what are these things that are coming because after the near death experience it opened up so much of mm -hmm. um of channels and um and insights and sensitivities that I didn't mm -hmm. previously have so I'm working out my own vocabulary and and language based on feelings and communication mm -hmm. um so just because you have those doesn't mean you have all the answers. Just because you have yeah. a near-death experience and you've been told something doesn't mean you have all the answers. Right. It could have been for a particular timeline that no longer exists because the collective has lifted us out of that timeline. I've had prophetic dreams that were very scary. And now, and I was convinced that those were going to happen mm -hmm. because the dreams are very different. You can tell the difference between a typical dream and a prophetic dream. And I believe that we are out of that possibility. Mm -hmm. So yes, I totally agree with what you're saying is that being aware of these things, but not leaning into the fear right. is very valuable. You have, you have health insurance, you have insurance for your care, uh, for your car, why not have, you know, make some preparations for yourself, have mm -hmm. some extra water, have some extra food, have right. some extra cash if it's possible, yeah. but not to lean into this mass conscious fear mm -hmm. because I believe that my source creator God is going to guide me of what I need and what I need to prepare. And I will be where I need to be during this time of change. Thus, what I was saying, I want to be, become more in tune, and, and that is part of it, so that I can get my own guidance on that. Yes. I do find, though, and what are your thoughts on this, that it's interesting that I've been studying near-death experiences for a long, long time, and especially this past decade, I've read and heard, you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, really, stories, probably. and. It seems like there's something different, though, now. There's something that people are, are expecting, a change. And I just find that interesting. I didn't really hear that five years ago. Do you find that, too? Clarify that for me. People are expecting a change, meaning in, in our experience and our, our life a, experience? Yeah, as a collective, mm -hmm. that there may be some very challenging times ahead whether it's a natural disaster or whether it's something that the reason why that you're saying, oh, I'll have a little extra food on hand, you know, if electricity goes out for just a little bit or something. Um, it, it is interesting that there's more talk of it now than I'd heard in the past. Yeah. Um, 
I do believe mm -hmm. we are here, all of us on the planet, for this extraordinary time in human history. Mm -hmm. I truly believe we are here at a soul level for the big show. I think that something, ex oh, I just got a nice confirmation. Um, oh. I truly believe something extraordinary is happening. And often with that, um, this is why we have sayings like, it's the darkest before the dawn, mm -hmm. right? These things happen. I mean, you have sayings because it's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I use the analogy of, of birthing. You know, you move through the birth canal, and I'm sure that baby thinks, you know, what is going on? <laughs> right? There's all excruciating pain, excruciating pain, um, and darkness before the freedom and the light. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there's also another, we could tie in the analogy of near-death experiences. When your soul leaves the body, it is expansive. You felt that yourself right. through your meditation. You are an expansive being. Mm -hmm. And I've heard many times, if you knew how powerful yeah. you were, you would never be fearful. Right. So I believe that we are, and I'll tie in some astrology, we are moving in and have, we're at the beginning of moving into the age of Aquarius. And I don't know a lot, again, about mm -hmm. astrology, but to me, it was just one of those pieces to the puzzle. And the energy, the theme around Age of Aquarius is love and unity and compassion and mm -hmm. also making what was once hidden, bringing it to light. Mm -hmm. So think about all the things that are being brought to light right now that are super dark, tragic things, horrible things being done to people. And I won't go into, you know, all of it, but celebrity, you can, you know, Google or you can go on any social mm -hmm. media and you'll see all of it. So when I see that, I'm like, yes, more of the darkness is being brought to light. Oh, interesting. So people will say, look at how horrible this is. These people doing horrible things, whether it's, you know, uh, or, uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, all these things that are happening that are horrific. We're hearing about it now because it's being brought to light. How do we fix it if we don't know about it? If we walk around our existence with blinders on and we don't know that these horrible things are happening in our world, how do we rise above the energy of it? That's such a great perspective. I had never considered that. So... I have to believe for myself mm -hmm. that there is something extraordinary and beautiful and that we are moving through this darkness so that we can have heaven on earth, so that we can have our fullness, our expandedness, because all these, these senses that I have developed since the near-death experience, that came in since the near-death experience, these are for everyone. These are not just new. And I, I shut down a lot of it. Because I was like, I don't, I don't want to have to deal with all of this. Yeah. But they are, are gifts that live within all of us. And that the things that made us shut that down, those external forces that controlled that by fear, by keeping us busy and distracted and, um, and just survival, once we can break through that and have the freedom to really understand who we are, we will open that and that will expand. And then that's a ripple effect into the world. Yeah. And we think about the times that we have grown and become better people. It's usually not when life is easy and great and good things are coming your way. It's when you stumble and fall and scrape your knees up and you pick yourself back up. And during, while it's happening, it's very challenging. And you're going, why is this happening to me? But when you come out of it and you can see the growth that occurred, I find in my life, you know, that's when I've made the biggest strides. And sometimes some of those things can be a lifelong struggle. I mean, some people, when we have these challenges that are given to us in childhood or experiences in childhood, it takes a long time to work through them. But, you know, once you can or once you do, You've learned a lot and you're, you're a better person for that. And probably some of the challenging people in our life are put there 
for us to be able to overcome and to have growth ourselves. Absolutely. Yes, I totally agree. Yeah. I think on the other side, um, sometimes those are the most loving mm. souls in our soul group, the right. ones that showed up to be that really, I'll air quote, awful people in mm. our lives, the most challenging people um, that that would give us the contrast for the growth. Right. Because that's what we have here. We have contrast. We're living on a planet of contrast. And um, and when you are in the blissful state of non-contrast, how much learning goes on there? I don't I don't know. I think mm -hmm. we don't get to expand at the high high. Um, we don't get to expand at the heightened rate mm -hmm. that we do here. Yeah. So when did you have the aha moment about contrast and obstacles? Can you pinpoint a time where you? went through maybe a, a dark night of the soul or a very, very challenging time. And can you share with us when, when you really felt that you were able to move through that through your own inner work? Well, I will say this. I've definitely had that dark nights, not night, but probably dark nights of the soul where life has been very challenging. And it probably doesn't matter so much what I have gone through, and it probably was actually um, a conglomerate of many things kind of coming together. Because I think almost everybody faces something. And so everybody has that example that they can look back on their life. And they can say, um, yeah, that was that was really tough. But, but hey, I made it, I survived, and boy, I, I learned a few things along the way. So I would just say that you, we don't always see that in people. You wouldn't always know that when you just come across somebody. But I think we can pretty much gather that. It's amazing in life when, I, when you start to talk to close friends and, you know, we start to share things and you learn some of the things that they went through that I had no idea. And, and it's because, you know, those aren't things that you go around wearing on your t-shirt, but those often are the things that people overcome. And so everybody's had hardship. And that's why I think empathy is so important because we really don't know what people have gone through. How's that for a non-answer answer? answer? <laughs> no, it was beautiful. But it, yeah. it also brings me to when we do meet people mm -hmm. that are our triggers mm -hmm. or are mean-spirited people. Mm -hmm. I remember prior to the near-death experience, I was not the same person. And mm -hmm. and certainly even post-near-death experience, I'm not the same person as I am now. But the the idea of it must be so painful and exhausting to be that person that is screaming at someone else. Oh, yeah. Is you know, at the store and yelling at a clerk, right? It, if we can get to the point where we feel the compassion for that person, because to bring someone to that place, they they must be really in it. Yes, and it's and, and it's so, so hard to see that that when they're it is, it especially is. it might be easier when they're yelling at somebody else, but when they're yelling at mm -hmm. you or the, they're yelling at me, it's it's hard. Mm -hmm. But Boy, are those enlightened people that can do that. And boy, isn't that a good goal for all of us to have. And, and just think how quickly we could diffuse things if there was always that person that was just not going to engage. And, and it does take practice, like you were mm -hmm. saying before. And, mm -hmm. and if we use our life as to practice these right. things, right. Um, it will become easier and easier. And, and we and realize yeah, and, and even people that when you think of through your life that have harmed you along the way, they potentially, if you believe they could have been put in your life. And you also have to look at, okay, well, why did they do that? You know, how are they, what happened to them? Or how does their brain work differently? Because I would want to be in their brain. So I'm like, I'd rather be in my brain and have to deal with them than to have to deal 
deal with what, the way their brain works or something like that. I mean, mm-hmm. there's always ways to have empathy. And, and of course, there are things where it's almost impossible to do that when people have, you know, almost become dehumanized. Um, but in general, there's a lot of people that, you know, they make mistakes and they can be idiots, but that doesn't always mean that they are an idiot. It's that they acted like an idiot. Right. So, Absolutely. But again, easier said than done. And trust me, I'm not, I'm well, not this perfect. Is what we're, why we're doing this, right? Yeah. We're having mm-hmm. conversations so that maybe it's just a seed for someone that yeah. when they meet somebody today that happens to not be their optimal self, that yeah. they they uh, send them some love and healing and compassion. And and when you um, screw up and you don't do that and when you engage, then the other lesson is to learn to forgive ourselves well, because we're not always going to be perfect in our interactions. And if, you know, we can't always go back to the person unless it's like a family member and then you can. But, um, but sometimes we just have to let go of it ourselves because another bad habit humans have is we beat up ourselves. And that serves no purpose. It it really destroys us from the inside out. And we need yeah. to not do that as well. Lots of things we, keep, we shouldn't be doing. <laughs> well, but that's that takes us back to the self-love, self-care and right. mindfulness. Because right. who do we judge the most? Ourselves, for sure. Of course. Everybody mm-hmm. gets that right because it's true. Yeah. Um, we judge ourselves the most. So how can you expect to not judge others mm-hmm. if you're beating up yourself? all day. We have 50 to 70,000 thoughts a day. Yeah. How many of those are optimal, loving, mm-hmm. creative thoughts? Mm-hmm. And how many are the program and the pattern that you've set up for however old you are mm-hmm. that, that is less than optimal? And what I will say too, for some people that are listening is that is not always an easy task to turn off those negative thoughts that continue to, to go in your head. And a lot of times it has, it is a habit people have picked up from childhood and they, they've done it for so long that it's really hard to stop it. And that's where, you know, there are probably ways that those are probably times when you need to just get some help. If you can't shut it off yourselves sometimes. So you just have to always have something in mind where you just think of something else every time you notice it. And once you start to notice it, you'll notice it again and again. And if you keep shutting it off every time you notice it, you know, that's going to help you quite a bit. But but I'm not in any means saying that this is easy for some people because some people it's probably easy to do. It's not a habit they formed and other people it's um, really, really challenging to do. There's a technique that we use called uh, cancel clear. So the awareness, so mindfulness equals awareness and non-judgment. So Mm -hmm. it's the awareness piece. When you're just navigating your life and you have no idea that you're having these thoughts all the Mm -hmm. time, then Mm -hmm. there's nothing that can be done about that. You'll just perpetuate the pattern. But Mm -hmm. when you become aware of the pattern and then do what you're saying and then use a term like cancel clear, or there's another podcast interview with Maria Hosmer where um, her training was a little different where she used a word that was a positive word. She used Atlas, which is her horse's name, to bring her out of that negative thought. Mm. Um, And so whatever technique you use, but it's the awareness that's key. Um, I do want to uh, jump into another subject that um, that I love, and I think you do too, which is pets and animals. Mm -hmm. And you started um, uh, in the intro, we talked, uh, you you shared that you have pets, two cats Mm -hmm. and a dog, I think you said. How have- Three cats and a dog, which is actually- not a high amount for my for me. I've had well, more. talk talk to us about that. Share how animals have impacted your life and how um, why are they so important to you? Animals um, have always been a part of my life, and I think I remember as a kid when when I was sad or going through a challenging time, you know, just having my cat that I could hug and who just loved me unconditionally. It was such an important thing. And I'm so grateful to have had, to have grown up with pets. You know, we always had cats growing up. I'm definitely a cat person, but I love dogs too. And I've had a dog, um, you know, a couple of dogs now as an adult, which I love having. And um, 
but they are really important. And and what was your question exactly again about it? Was it I mean, how how have they impacted your life? Like oh, a lot of uh, yeah. people will say, like I'll go back to Maria again. She'll she'll say mm -hmm. that animals, her animals, her rescue animals yeah. have saved her life. Where yeah. you know have have they how have they impacted you in a in a positive way? I, I would think that's a lot of it. Is that you know they are there they're comforting, which is really nice. Um, also. You know, we feel good when we help another being. And so a lot of mine, well, all of mine are rescues of some sort. They're either from a shelter or they're a stray I found. Um, one of my cats now was feral and my daughter came across her. She was living outside of an apartment building and she was pregnant. And oh. so she was telling me about her and I'm like, well, we can't let all of those kittens, you know, be born and be feral as well. So we trapped her. And she, within a, a week of us having her, she had seven kittens. And it was so rewarding, though, to, we raised the kittens, and then we found beautiful homes for six of those kittens. And it just felt so good knowing that we made a difference. You know, some people do wonderful things to make a difference in a human life, but I think that it's also wonderful when we can make a difference in an animal's life. And then I had one kitten left and I had Gracie, the mother, left. And, of course, it's really hard to give away a feral cat. My original intention was to just get her fixed and then put her back. But, you know, once you get attached, I couldn't do that. And, and she's, she's still, we've had her now about three years and we kept one of her kittens. And she still won't let me pick her up. But she loves to be petted. She loves to follow me around from room to room. I've never had a cat seem so grateful. I mean, she truly seemed so grateful that we brought her into our house. And it's really a special feeling. So I like the idea of, of being able to help another animal. They make me feel good. Hopefully I'm giving them a better life. And and then I do have another cat that's an older cat as well. And my dog was also from from a shelter. Um, so, Do you think they have souls? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I've always said you can't love an animal and look into their eyes. I don't think. I guess people could, but I don't see how you could think they don't have a soul. And the more we learn from near-death experiencers, you know, even grass has some sort of a aliveness to it. I'm not sure exactly to what level, but everything, I mean, people have even said rocks do, and certainly our pets do. And many of them are probably placed in this world to teach us things and to help us learn and grow and to comfort us. I'm sure they're here for many reasons. Yeah, I and, totally agree. And many of us have a, a big heart for them because they're, a lot of times, um, they're helpless. You know, they they're out there without a home, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking sometimes. I always say I wouldn't have so many animals if I, if every cat had a home, if every dog had a home, but they don't. And so that's why I usually have multiple. Um, I've had up to six. Well, when I had the kittens, I had like 13 or something, <laughs> you know, but those we were planning on giving away, but I've had up to six. And, and that's a lot. Trust me, it's a lot of work. And, and I probably won't have that many again. But I always say you never say never, because who knows what shows up at my doorstep, you know. So. Yeah. And the, the house, the home feels fuller. And yeah. More, I don't know, there's something about having even one animal in your life. Yeah. And so my is rich. And, and my advice to everybody is if you're going to get an animal, you know, get it from a shelter because there are so many animals that get put down every year, literally millions. So to me, you're, you're rescuing something. But I also say never take a pet in that you don't plan to keep forever. They're not well, disposable. There's a responsibility mm -hmm. uh, and th they are work and there's a yeah. financial responsibility. They can be with expensive. Animals. And um, so... Uh, even though kittens or puppies are mm -hmm. adorable, right? Um, you know, you're going to lose sleep, right? Mm -hmm. It's there's you have to train them. It's it's like you know having this little being mm -hmm. that that needs guidance and and care. Yeah, I just I'm just so grateful to be here, and and like you said earlier, it's just so fun um, that we have connected, and I love this community of people because. 
I call it the near death experience community, but it really includes people that have had spiritual experiences or people that are just seekers like me. And it it's just such a great group because they are so loving and they are so wonderful. And when I hear somebody saying anything negative against my guests, I just think, oh man, if you really knew their heart, um, because um, it truly is a wonderful group of people. I totally agree. And it, I think I said it on one of another podcast mm -hmm. that I don't feel like I've ever been so authentically embraced, um, generously supported yeah. to and encouraged to do my own podcast mm -hmm. as this group. Yeah. If it weren't for me being on all these different podcasts and, mm -hmm. and whenever I would ask a question, just generous with your time and, mm -hmm. and, uh, authentically sharing, I, I totally agree. Um, and it doesn't matter if you have, you know, a hundred thousand subscribers or you mm -hmm. have a hundred subscribers, Yeah, everyone is the same. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that you call yourself a seeker. I've always called myself a seeker. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's not in just one area. It's like making known the unknown. I've always just, I think from an, an early uh, perspective, I wanted to be an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. Again, just wanting yeah. to make known the unknown. And then it moved very much into the spiritual arena. And so what is... What's in store for you in your own seeking? Is there anything that is lighting you up right now that you're like, oh, I want to learn more about that? I think it's just continuing. As When I talk to people that have had either spiritually transformative experiences or near-death experiences, I often learn something new. And so I just, I don't know what is out there, but I'm very interested in, in seeing what there is to know. So I'm not even necessarily sure what I'm seeking other than just wanting to know more. And to me, it is so fun because as you, you know, we were just saying seekers, I, I've always felt like a seeker my whole life. And that's why I think these things are, are so interesting to me. And probably what many of your audience members, when they're listening to this, they may be thinking, because many of us are like this, you know, I don't have friends that are necessarily into this. And that's okay, because we have our own community here, which is very special that we can connect on these podcasts, whether we're on them or whether we're listening to them, because I, you know, listen, I love listening to podcasts like yours and other podcasts, because I'm always wanting to learn more from people as well as my own guests. And the fact that we are not isolating so much now yeah. and in this opportunity of podcasting mm -hmm. that we can have these conversations and build relationships. I've mm -hmm. become great friends with, with people that um, are in this arena yeah. and I love it. It's mm -hmm. just so beautiful. And then it gives people some permission, I guess, to speak their truth and to get comfortable with having these conversations. And for this podcast, Sunday Communion, it's really about allowing people to say, hey, I'm going to integrate this into all aspects of my life. It's not just over here in this little drawer that I get to pull out and talk about near-death experiences or spiritual experiences, mm -hmm. um, but or even prayer and talking about God. Um, this is who I am. I am a spiritual being having mm -hmm. this physical experience, mm -hmm. and I am um, fully evolved in it. And this was part of my journey to be able to say, hey, this professional life that I have um, needs to integrate with this huge part of my life, which yes. is really what lights me up, and to blend that into the whole person. And so, and this goes, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and this goes back to something we were talking about how challenging times we grow. A lot of these podcasts that many of us are enjoying 
came out of COVID. It was a very challenging time, but people had to find new ways of doing things. And, and that's one of the ways I was able to realize I could do this is because my work, I was shooting things now from home. My editor, you know, was at his home, the graphics person at their home. And, you know, the analytics guy was at his home. So it, it really created something that many people are now enjoying. And it's just one more example of what hardship can bring. And then also what you said, you know, being able to marry your career, the things that you've been doing with some of your passions, it's just an amazing thing. And, and that's exactly how it was for me too, being able to bring my experience in broadcasting, but then bringing into it um, the spiritual aspect. It's, it's just been incredible to be able to bring those two together. Did you ever feel um, a little hesitant about the subject matter? Oh, that oh, because I'm a you know I'm a educated and a professional journalist, and now I'm talking near death experiences. Did you ever have kind of a? Not for that reason. More so was, I didn't want to hurt anybody, who this was too out there for, because there are many people that are very strong in their faith. And that was my concern. I did not want to hurt some people I knew because this was, would have been, it is still outside of their comfort zone. And so that did give me pause. And it really, it probably took me two or three years to work up the confidence and to have my husband say, no, go, you should do this. But that also was a good time for me to formulate what I wanted to do. Because if I had jumped right in, initially, when I first had this idea of wanting to do a podcast, it would have been the wrong thing for me. And it just, it evolved over that time of me being a little nervous about stepping into it. And, and when I, I kind of started out slow, and, you know, I think I introduced a little bit more things that maybe initially I wouldn't have been as comfortable presenting, that now seem very much natural and things that I've gotten comfortable talking about. And and because there are other people doing it, it is becoming more mainstream, yeah. that understanding of what it is, that mm -hmm. it is not, um, it's not against anybody's belief system. It's, it's really an integration of a spiritual, a healthy spiritual life. And I think a lot of people need that because they're not always getting that spiritual food from traditional ways that we used to get it. And I think this is really something that feeds my soul. And I think it probably feeds a lot of people that are listening right now. You know, this, this is how they get. It's almost like we're plants and we need that sunshine. You know, this is that sunshine that we need and, um, you know, you're providing it, which is a wonderful service. Oh, that's the back. <laughs> you know, I've never, ever talked about my book before publicly. I love this. When oh. After our interview mm -hmm. um, and we chatted and I don't know how we came on your hair doodle book, but you were so gracious and sent it to me. And I love this. I actually oh. then put it on my storefront, my Amazon mm -hmm. storefront, because um, this is a must have for everyone. And now coming towards mm -hmm. the holiday season, everybody should get this. Um, um, how did this come about? It came about because it, it started because I, I love to draw. I've always loved to draw. My mom was a beautiful artist. And I always said that's one of the greatest gifts she gave me is the ability to have artistic talent. And so I used to always draw, and my drawing was often cartoony style. And whereas a couple of my sisters have just, they could draw something so beautifully realistic. And that was never me. I couldn't do that. But I loved it. And then, you know, when you don't, as we were talking about practice early, when you don't do it, you get rusty. And so I really wasn't drawing. And so I noticed I was getting rusty. And then I got like a doodle a day book where, you know, I set the intention, okay, I'm going to draw just doodle. It doesn't even have to be a drawing, just doodle every day. 
And then I started drawing more and more and I started liking this. And, and I'm like, you know, goal of mine was always to publish some sort of a book, just kind of a goal. You know, a lot of people have, um, never expected to make money and I haven't. So don't worry if you're listening, thinking, oh, she's just selling a book to make money. Trust me. I haven't. I've lost a lot more than I've ever gained. And most but, people do. Yeah. I don't, uh, and that's what people don't realize. Right. I often, I know. they're critical of people. Oh, they're just on your show to sell a book. Well, yeah, no, that's not it. Yeah. But um, anyway, so it evolved into, I decided I'm going to do this book. And I created it. And it's one of those checks in the box. I am so thrilled to do it. I've barely picked up a pencil since then. <laughs> Oh, really? And I've gotten rusty again, but I could get back to it. I realize that now because I did it that time. But I had so much fun creating it. And it really, and, I, I love the cover. It oh, feels so good. And the colors, it's just. It's, yeah. And it basically, for it, it was kind of out of Zen doodling. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with that, if your audience yeah. is, but it's just making these cute little patterns over and over again. And it's kind of a mindless task. In a way, it's a type of meditation. And so it's basically, you know, I, I have this book of these women's hair, all kinds of different, yeah. and it's kind of slightly cartoonish style where you can add, yeah, and I give you one that's an example. Here's what you could do, and then you could do your own, but you could also just color in it. If you could use it as just a coloring book. So it was just something very fun I did, and um, I have no expectations for any of you to go out and get it, but I, you know, it well, was just a beautiful accomplishment for me personally to do. It is. It's a, to write a book uh, in any capacity and get it's it a lot of work yeah. done yeah. is a labor of love. It is. And you don't do it to make a living, right. much less a fortune, but <laughs> even like pay one bill. You don't, yeah. because I don't think people realize how little return it is. You do it because you have to do it. It's like either it's the content in is in you and yes. you have to get it out or yes. it's just an exercise of creativity because you're a writer or you're an artist. And um, it's a legacy. It's a legacy that I often think, you know, someday when I have grandkids, you know, I will give them this, you know, this will be something for them as well. So it, it's, it's, it's sharing ourselves with with people that are close to us. And then, you know, hopefully some other people enjoy it too along the way. That's a really great statement. It's sharing ourselves. And with that mm -hmm. comes a vulnerability yeah. to be out there and, mm -hmm. and share ourselves in this way, because especially like this is so creative and, mm -hmm. um, and, and for someone who I've always said that I'm not a creative person, and yet mm -hmm. I developed that creativity and doodling and and uh, journaling and having something outside of your norm to yeah. really focus that creativity is very helpful in your overall health and well-being. Right. So uh, this is a great this is a great gift and, uh, or to, you know, for yourself. So I, I love it. So oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. That was so sweet of you to no, mention that. I, 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 I can't stop touching the cover. It's just <laughs> one of those, <laughs> you know, the texture is, mm -hmm. um, I was really pleased. I really love it. Yeah. I was really pleased at how it turned out, but I haven't even mentioned it on my podcast. So that was very nice of you. <laughs> So as I thank you, you've been with me for quite a while and I thank you for your time. But You're as welcome. we are wrapping up, mm -hmm. you are a mom um, and I have one child mm -hmm. uh, who is now a young adult. And I think that as we are at the stages of our lives now where we've learned, hopefully learned some stuff, mm -hmm. do you have any words of wisdom that you would like to share with whether it's your younger self or with the younger generation of what you would do differently or how, you know, like kind of like a cheat sheet of how to live life um, with more ease and grace. Well, when you said your younger self, then right away I could think, oh, yeah, there are so many things I could tell my younger self. But I think one of them is don't be afraid. Go after your dreams. And as that one saying goes, if you reach for the stars and you miss at least you've still gained the moon or something like that. It's, it's, I love and, that. And expect, that's awesome. Expect and be okay with failing. 
because that is not the end if you fail and you stumble and you fall and you're like, oh, I didn't make it. Because that doesn't mean there's not something much better around the corner. And so I, I would just say, believe in yourself. As Lee was saying earlier, if we knew how amazing and powerful we are, you know, we would never be afraid. And I think go after things and, and believe in yourself and do look for guidance and, and push yourself to be your best self. And along the way, be kind and be nice to everyone you encounter. I love it. Thank you, my dear You're new welcome. friend. No, oh, to you, friend, as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's been I so wonderful you. being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I wish you so much luck with this podcast. And although we always say there's no luck, is there? It's just <laughs> I we just keep plugging along. <laughs> I, I wish you the Intention. very best, though. I I, I really Thank look you. forward to a much success with your show. Yeah. Thanks, Heather. Take care. Bye, right, everybody. Bye. -bye.